coding right so you can uh, review later on as well if something missed or you want to review later on you can do it so once again on the 7th of july welcome everyone on the board of medical mcq for all those who are joining first time just a quick rehash what we are doing we are providing all uh, online subscriptions online coaching we have a prometric thousand mcq book uh, so we have a hard copy book as well as soft copy book so those who are interested they can place order online we do the online subscription and coachings every day by the experts we have WhatsApp subscription, Oman Viva coaching and subscription, all data flow services done from Dubai by Dr. Anjali. We have an excellent package, short sort for those second trial or third trial or last trial. They can go a short sort package, it's money back guarantee and mobile application on Android and iPhone. So if you are not using, you can download the mobile applications as well. So completely whole website can be accessed from one uh, uh, excellent application. This is myself. I'm primarily trained in hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplant, almost practicing for 20 years, and uh, treated more than 100,000 patients and coaching experience for more than 10, 11 years. So I would try my level best to uh, get you through the excellent journey of MCQ. This is Dr. Arti, who is a consultant pediatrician in my team, taking daily classes of pediatrics as well, uh, periodically. Dr. Mehdi is an emergency physician, uh, Dr. Shikha is a consultant gynecologist. Dr. Ankit again is a gastroenterologist, uh, DM. So all are specialized in their own field. Uh, also Pallavi, Meghna and uh, this Dr. Anjali is also there. So this is our contact detail, hard copy book as I explained to you. This is hard copy book, latest updated in January, February. So excellent. Again, the big things coaching what we are doing now we are doing today the mock test but coaching excellent offer 440 hours coaching earlier it used to be 500 but it is now flat 50 percent discount so those who are interested uh, contact my support team and apply the promo code of coaching 50 uh, data flow is done from dubai by dr anjali right uh, her numbers are there so any query uh, any questions related data flow documentation any wherever you stuck up just directly call or message her. She will be available and she'll guide you as soon as possible. The last couple of things interesting. We developed two new modules recently. One, we make a new mock test module on the website. So you can use it. Those who are using our subscription of any one month or 12 months, any subscription online, they have the facility of giving the mock test. They can monitor their score. They can assess uh, themselves and this module uh, gives complete idea what is wrong. I mean, what what how many questions are right, how many wrongs, where you did mistake, what's your score, and it will completely uh track a record of last two months, three months, six months, whatever the uh mock you had given so far, completely monitored on the one page by computer. So it is an excellent newly things. It is in your package at no extra cost. And second thing is those who feel that I don't want to go for any subscription. I'm ready to go for exam. So for that, recently, two days back, we created one new subscription for mock test, right? So you, you can just only subscribe the mock test and try to give few mock tests and try to check your score before you are going for the exam. If your score is not more than 75, 80, it's not a good idea to go for exam. This is general statement uh, of uh, 100 plus of doctors assessment. Right, what happens when they are giving the exam uh, around 60 percent and around 80 percent? So chances are very high of passing the exam when they have 80 or around 80 or 80 plus code. Uh, and uh, two couple of things we are coming up with the new things is one Emory residency exam that is called Emirate Medical Residency Entrance Exam uh, with Dr. Afrin. So we are launching this course soon in a month or so. So probably the next Sunday we are planning to organize one Emory webinar. So I'll post it in the group, but tentatively it's next Sunday, right? Or 14th of the July, but I will update you after, I mean, discussing with other team members who are also involved uh, and presenting the Emory thing. So those who are interested, it's free webinar. You can join what is a prospectus post MBBS. If you want to do post graduation in UAE or Dubai, what are the questions? I mean, this uh, documentation, eligibility criteria, blah, blah. 
So all things will be covered in 30 to 40 minutes of webinar. So just keep a watch on it. And uh, we are also coming up with dental, uh, this uh, exam preparation, shortly preparing on that as well. So apart from GP, now uh, family medicine, emergency physicians, Emory Dental, and very shortly coming up with the exclusive gynec uh, test as well. So that's it for today. I mean, this is the brief introduction and let's now jump to our main subject. So everybody gets ready. I would be very happy if you post your answer, forget about right or wrong. It's considered in that way, if the same questions comes in your exam, how you going to react, right? And these all questions are frequently asked questions. I selected very important, little tricky as well. Right. So you don't expect every time that you get a lollipop or very easy questions in the exam. 30% of the questions are a little googly and a little weird as well. So you need to prepare yourself, not just easy, easy questions you prepare. Right. So this is one of them. Right. So let's jump uh, to the question. Number one, which of the following medication is a most uh, uh, associated with the QT prolongation? Right. There are list of the medicine. So just keep in mind. Uh, this is a chlorpromazine, clozapine, haloperidol, olanzipine, quetapine, and zipraxidone. So your time starts now. You have every questions whenever you are, I mean, doing in the exam, you have hardly 15 seconds for any questions, right? So you need to quick, uh, be little fast in interpreting as well. So time management is again a very, very important in any exam, right? So, so this is, uh, the things. Yes, Dr. Dinesh Javlikar. I mean, now it's time for interaction. So we'll discuss, don't worry, uh, about right, wrong. So why why you think this is a quitapin or what's what's wrong with the quitapin? Yes. Uh, I may not be explain it, but uh, I remember the drug causes quitapin. Sorry? Uh, I may not be explain it, but uh, I remember that causes okay so you 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 i mean somewhere remember in the past that this yeah. could be the uh drug yes, sir. fine fair yes, enough sir. but that's okay i mean i'm happy at least you interacted with me so i'm very glad extremely glad okay fine no worries right anyone else wants to comment on this and what are the side effects of other drugs as well what are the side effects of other drugs as well So, haloperidol. Go one by one. Clozapine, clos I mean, chlorpromazine, clozapine, haloperidol. Because they can ask anything, right? You you can't expect that they will ask these questions only, right? You understand. So I want you to understand any questions as a whole. Not just, I, I am not here to mug up you the answer and end up the session. I mean, I'm here to give you the real uh, idea about how you prepare for the all MCQs and these things. Yes, go one by one. Any volunteer, it's fine. I mean, it's right, wrong, don't worry. Yes. Fine. So that means you need to little know the side effects of drugs as well, right? So what they are asking, which of the following medication is most uh, associated with the prolonged QT? So this is, uh, first you need to understand what is QT interval or long QT interval. So this is a, uh, if you see here, this is a PQRST, right? So... This is a P wave and then the Q wave, then this is R wave, right? S is like S and this is T. So distance between Q to T is called QT interval. So this is interval is called QT interval. This is a normal QT interval. Here you can see long QT interval. So what is a prognostically or what is the importance of having a QT interval on ECG on someone, uh, the person? Right, so QT interval, let us let me guide you first what is QT interval. So QT interval is prolonged if it is a greater than 440 milliseconds. So first you need to know how to calculate this millisecond. Right, so attend sometimes our uh, ECG lectures as well. Time constraint, I am not going much in detail of ECG now. But for you to know, it is very important. QT interval is prolonged if it is greater than 414 male and greater than 416 woman. Any QT interval greater than 500 is associated with increase the risk of torsa D pointers. So now again the question will come. So what, sir, what do you mean by torsa D pointers? So torsa D pointers is something in which 
right torsadi pointer is a specific type of ventricular tachycardia so remember this don't get confused torsadi pointer is a a uh, specific type of ventricular tachycardia or fast heart rate that begins in your heart ventricle right what are the complication if your ventricular tachycardia means it may convert into fibrillation and death as well and syncope these are the most important things related with the torsadi pointer so let's get back to the subject right what was the questions that what was the questions which of the following medication right is associated with qt prolongation so answer is not the e right these all are the list of the drug and correct answer is zipracidone is a atypical antipsychotic that is the most associated with qt prolongation chlorpromazine is a typically antipsychotic with severe sedative adverse effects so again first is severe sedative side effect right clozapine is associated with a granulocytosis a granulocytosis means bone marrow suppression right so if the somebody has a cytopenia significant patient is a psych Psychiatric patient, so you cannot start. Supposed to start close up in. Already, it's a myelosuppression, and you are giving the drug which cause a granulocytosis, significant reduction of the neutrophil in the blood or bone marrow. It's called a granulocytosis. So close up in the specific side effect. Just write down or remember one liner. Close up in a granulocytosis. Haloperidol, extra pyramidal symptoms. Olanzapin. It can cause the uh, raised triglyceride or abnormal lipid profile, somnolence, hyperglycemia, weight gain. So if any patient with a diabetes, with a bad lipid and comes to you as a psychiatric patient, it's better to avoid olanzapine. Why? Because they are already diabetic patient. They already triglyceride high, diabetic patient, obese patient. And on top of that, you are giving olanzapine, you are increasing weight, worsening the lipid and sugar as well. So these are the specific side effects. Uh, and uh, this uh, quetapine includes the orthostatic hypertension and dizziness, right? So this is very, very important. You must remember the drug. So long QT syndrome is a heart signaling disorder that can cause fast chaotic heartbeats, right? And uh, the long QT interval can cause sudden fainting and seizure. Young people with long QT interval syndrome has increased risk of sudden death. And treatment for long QT interval or syndrome includes lifestyle changes and medication which reduces the heart rate or which controls the heart rate. And in few cases, if there is an extra additional pathway, then you may need some kind of surgery or implant or devices to control the heartbeat like a pacemaker. That's it. So this is what the question is. So you need to know each and every side effect of basic drugs very, very frequently asked in all the exams. And we try to avoid this. Usually we are neglecting this, right? So we are not uh, doing this. So, uh, I mean, uh, you need to know, you need to know, absolutely you need to know, right, uh, that uh, what's the side effects and what's the profile, right? So without knowing that, you cannot know. So now go, I mean, I don't want you to do a lot of PhD in this uh, things, right? But I want at least you know the basic side effect of each drug, not this, thus, the QT interval kind of, wala things, right? you need to know basic side effects of most of the drugs. One side effect, two side effect, what they are trying to explain. So now you check your score. One question I asked, whether it is right or wrong. If it is wrong, marked in your note. You don't need to display me how, what's your score, but you self assess yourself, right? Think that if tomorrow exam and your score is 30% today, this is not a good idea. Try to prepare hard, right? So one, this is correct answer. One out of one, if wrong, one out of zero, right? I mean, zero out of one, sorry. So second questions, right? 46 years old Japanese American woman present to her primary care physician with complaint of increasing shortness of breath, fatigue, chest pain, abdominal distension, fainting uh, spell. She has a history of amyloidosis for which she has been repeatedly hospitalized. Her EKG or ECG shows low voltage QRS complex. Her vital signs are stable. Her laboratory values are normal. Which of the following would be the most helpful in the establishing the correct diagnosis following most, uh, right? So following are the things, following is the most likely diagnosis, right? So what could be, what could be the taste or what could be from the below list would, would establish the correct diagnosis? Right. So diagnosis they had given. Right. So you, this is the in exam. Nobody will interpret uh, for you like me. They had given you that a history of amyloidosis. So there could be something related with amyloidosis. Right. So now how, what test will confirm the diagnosis or correct the diagnosis established? 
cardiac enzyme ct scan of abdomen echo uh, recheck the potassium x ray of the chest what do you think now you post your answer dr ajdani can you tell me what, what's your logic of putting the answer a dr ajdani Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Go ahead. You selected, I think, answer cardiac enzyme, what I can see. So, so yes, explain sir. me three things. One minute, one minute. We'll discuss. Hope you are not in hurry. I'm not in hurry. Because without understanding, you cannot answer any question in exam. Mugging up will not help you at all. So, now onwards, everyone, those who are attending this class, try to make a habit from today, right? Before answering any MCQ, you need to know, you need to ask yourself, what is the diagnosis of this patient? How you investigate this patient or what is the best in, important investigation and what is the treatment? So this is the triad I created by my own, by the experience, right? What is the diagnosis? How you investigate this patient and how you treat this patient? So say, for example, you are solving 100 MCQ today means you are solving 300 MCQ. Why? Because in one MCQ, you need to know now three things, right? What is the diagnosis? What is investigation? What is treatment? So if you are solving 100 questions today or 50 questions means you are solving 150 question. If 100, then it is 300. If you are solving 200, means it's 600. Multiply by three because you need to know each and every case from now onwards. What is the diagnosis? What is the investigation? And what is the treatment? Now your turn starts now. Yeah. Tell me, Dr. Ajdani. I will write down whatever you speak. What's the diagnosis? or likely diagnosis or possible diagnosis. Tell me. Yes, Ajudari, tell me now. Because until and unless you have the clarity in your mind, definitely you are just giving the answer, but you don't know how you answer, how you, I mean, interpret the questions and uh, what's your logic and understanding before answering the things. So if you do not understand the question well, there are 99% chance that you may not give a good proper answer in the exam because you did not understood the question you don't know the diagnosis you don't know the basic then you are just randomly clicking then that don't help you honestly i am not here to disappoint you but i am here to come here today as eye opener right what and how you need to prepare that is more important yes dr ajdani if you would like to interact you can i would be happy Well, um, di diagnosis uh, not related. I'm not sure, sir. Whatever you read the questions, I am not in hurry at all. If yeah. this questions comes in your exam without diagnosis, how will gonna diagnose these things, right? Or how you establish the diagnosis? If you think it is acute myocardial infarction, your answer may change. If you think your this is case of valvular heart disease, your answer may change. If you think it is infective yeah. endocarditis, your answer may change. If you think coarctation of aorta, your answer will change. So, so you need to make a diagnosis. Extremely important. Okay, fine. So you could not catch up, right? Okay, fine. What could be the diagnosis? Uh, so, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Nirja, if you are in the class, if you would yeah. like to comment on this, I would be happy and glad to interact with you. If you have something in your mind, Uh, could be a heart failure. Uh, the patient has had since patient of amyloid. Fair enough. So we'll go step by step. Uh, I'm going to write down the thing so you also get clarity. I also get clarity, right? So uh, tentatively by you, it's a heart failure, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. And what could be the cause of heart failure? Heart failure is there, but there must be something wrong in this patient because of that heart failure. Uh, is I think a broad term, isn't it? Yes, yes. Heart failure, but what could be the cause of heart failure? It is a endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. There are three causes of heart failure, right? If something wrong, say for example, pericardial effusion, very bad pericardial effusion, patient may have heart failure. Patient has valvular heart disease, they may have heart failure. Patient have acute myocardial infarction, low ejection fraction, down the line, they have heart failure, right? So what could be the thing? So understand, this is the extremely important tips today for everyone, each and everyone. In the, if you read the questions well, again, let me give you a little more out of the way advice. 
say for example whatever the exam you guys are giving we are almost 40 people in class 90 second you have for each question 90 second you don't have more than 90 second if you want to solve 150 question in a time frame what's given by dha hard moh oms bsml eql eqc hp nhra all exam i spoken so 90 second try to spend 85 seconds by my experience of coaching thousands of doctors spend 85 seconds on reading the mcq don't jump to give the answer because this is this if you spend more time on this your this part would be very easy and this take just 5 seconds 85 plus 5 seconds is equal to 90 seconds so try to maximum time you can spend reading understanding interpreting and ask yourself before pushing the answer or posting the answer what could be diagnosis how you investigate how you treat just make a habit of doing quickly in your mind Right. So, Dr. Nirja, this is, I mean, by generally, if you can again go uh, back to the scenario, it's a case of likely amyloidosis. They have given the history, right? 46 years old Japanese American present with primary care physician. Uh, you are with me, Dr. Nirja, right? Yes. Increased yes. shortness of breath. So, shortness of breath is a sign of heart failure. Absolutely. Fatigue is a sign of heart failure. Chest pain, definitely, probably there is a less blood supply to the myocardium heart failure right yes and, yes and abdominal distension probably may have ascites heart is not pumping well so you may have edema usual in the lower limb or so right so and fainting why because blood is not pumping probably the ejection fraction is low in this there are two type of heart failure systolic heart failure diastolic heart failure biggest difference is systolic heart failure ejection fraction ef or some people in eco report as lvef left ventricular ejection fraction would be low normal it is 50 to 55 and in diastolic ef is absolutely normal this is just the basic concept so this patient is quite symptomatic ejection fraction compromised and they shows low voltage qrs complex so voltage is low what do you mean by low voltage this is normal voltage just for your knowledge i am drawing so this is pqrst low voltage is what p is small q is small r is small right something is restricting heart is not pumping well and that is why so whatever the reason heart is pumping not well you have all low voltage low voltage means magnitude or peak or the uprise in the qrs will be small in size normal in size very high in size so low voltage this is this is a normal and instead of that this 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 is the qrs so this is normal this is low so low voltage so everything fits the congestive heart failure or heart failure case right go a little bit further and they are saying right uh, and history of amyloidosis so there is a clear cut history of she has a history of amyloidosis right she has a completely clear cut history of amyloidosis means they have she has amyloidosis right so now tell me dr nirja what is amyloidosis what do you understand by amyloidosis right what happens in amyloidosis this all are exam questions don't take it otherwise so they may ask you amyloidosis related questions as well this is credit question so, do you have any idea, doctor, in your mind what is exactly the amyloidosis means? Yeah, it's a it's a systemic multi system storage disorder. It will affect many uh, systems like heart, liver, and uh, kidney. So, in Excellent. heart, I think the myocardium is getting affected because of the storage of this. Wonderful. Uh, so, this is obstructive disease or restrictive disease? Uh, it's a restrictive disease. I'm not sure. No, no, it is restrictive. You are absolutely right because excessive amyloid is a kind of a protein which gets accumulated in the myocardium. It does not allow the heart to expand well, right, and contract well. And that is why you all the down the line amyloidosis, right? The cause of death in amyloidosis is a heart failure, right? So okay. you need to treat the amyloidosis. As you rightly said that it is deposited in heart, it is in the kidney, present with protein urea, edemas and then you do the kidney biopsy you find the amyloidosis is there any special stain which confirms the diagnosis of amyloidosis anyone open for all anyone anyone knows that there is a special stain right or by doing this we can know that okay this is fine this is amyloidosis anyone we are more than 30 40 people in the class right so this is your homework i am not disclosing the answer go and read it this is also question last time asked in dha right give the name of the test which confirms the diagnosis of amyloidosis so you need to give an answer right anyway so we go little further 
which of the following so now this is classical case this case is looks like a amyloidosis known case now presented with the heart failure and they will find they will try to understand that by doing which test you can establish the correct diagnosis so dr nirja what do you think which is the most important test among this which confirms the diagnosis of congestive heart failure or restrictive heart failure because patient has amyloidosis patient is now having a symptoms of classical heart failure so by doing which test you know that okay fine this is reasonable mm -hmm. It's an uh, echocardiogram we have to do so as to know the ejection fraction. and Excellent. Excellent. So your concept is absolutely clear. So this is the test. By knowing this, if the ejection fraction is 30%, we confirm that, okay, so echocardiogram is the test. Now, Dr. Nirja, I would like to give you one more hint for your preparation, right? When you give this answer is correct, 100%. But why not cardiac enzyme? Let me explain you. Cardiac enzyme is why not the answer? Because we are not suspecting acute coronary syndrome. There is no history of ST elevation. There is no cardiac enzyme which suggests that it is a myocardial infarction. So nothing goes in favor of. So we are not thinking acute coronary syndrome. That is why cardiac enzymes are useless. CT scan of abdomen, it is nothing to do with CT scan abdomen. We are not thinking any abnormality in abdomen or pelvis. So CT scan does not help. Recheck the potassium. By checking the potassium, whether it is high, low or normal, it will not going to reflect anything on amyloidosis. And X-ray X is just see, see, you see the cardiomegaly, right? right? But, but again, it's not specific uh, than echocardio because echocardiography will not give you only idea about ejection fraction, but it also gives you idea about the valvular pathology, myocardial pathology, pericardial pathology, and lots of things, right? Which is not given by X-ray. So, considering all the quests most sensitive and specific is the echocardiogram. So here we go. So woman has a restrictive cardiomyopathy, not obstructive, Dr. Nirja. So just keep in mind, excessive amyloid fibril or protein gets accumulated in the muscle of the heart. So restrictive cardiomyopathy, there are two variety. Heart failure can be classified in various ways. One is obstructive cardiomyopathy, one is restrictive cardiomyopathy. One, uh, this is a diastolic heart failure, systolic heart failure. So you must know the basic. I don't want to do PhD in cardiology, but just basic because they ask the basic. This condition is often brought by the infi uh, infiltrative disease. What infiltrate? Amyloid fibril. And the same example is amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, carcinoid syndrome, right? And uh, to identify this condition, it is helpful to obtain an echocardiogram to distinguish it from the other possible cause of valvular and cardiomyopathy as I told you and cardiac catheterization could also be done right so that's it this is what the answer is so this is how you want to interpret each and every MCQ in your exam and in your practice while you are doing at home from the mock test from our website so this is what the thing is I just try to evaluate what is the low uh, voltage ECG so if you can see QRS complex is very very small very very small right so this is a uh, this uh, low QT if it is a normal, then what happens? This is P, this is QRS. Compared with this size, this is very small size. Right? So this is normal. But because of the uh, pathology, uh, you have Q, uh, short QRS. Uh, so low voltage. So what, what are the other conditions where you get the low voltage? Obesity, obviously. COPD, pericardial effusion, severe hypothyroidism, subcutaneous emphysema, myocardial infarction, and infiltrative like amyloidosis. This is what the MCQ, right? So these are the condition where you get a low voltage ECG. So you just need to keep in mind. I mean, they may help you sometimes in the exam. So is that clear, Dr. Nirja? Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So let's move to the next questions. We had so far two questions. Check your score to our Two out of two, I would be very happy. Question number three. Now try to implement all your energy in interact dissecting the MCQ. As I told you in question number two, spend more time on the reading the question so you get better idea that what exactly they want. So 17-year-old boy is brought to the emergency department by paramedic. He has found unconscious after a motor vehicle accident. Upon the presentation, the patient is noted to have multiple mandibular and maxillary fracture as well as open right-sided tibia fibula fracture. 
the patient remains unconscious and with the oxygen saturation of 78% on 2 liter oxygen via face mask with the pulse rate of 146 a blood pressure of 60 over 20 millimeter of Hg what or the which of the following is the first step in the management you administer fluid continue with the face mask ventilation proceed with the rest of the primary trauma survey proceed with cricothyrotomy proceed with nasopharyngeal intubation and proceed with oropharyngeal intubation Simple. Nothing urgent. Just take some time to understand the questions. Right? Another important mind, meanwhile, you are, I mean, this thing, sometimes these words are very confusing to us. Right? Most important, first step, most accurate, initial taste. Dr. Mozam, any idea? Dr. Mozam. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Uh, Moazam, if you are there, you can, yes, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, information, uh, airway, information. Okay, so, 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 so let me first understand. One second, sir, one second. Sorry to bother you. Tell me what's the diagnosis. We don't break this diagnosis, investigation, treatment. Believe me, if you follow this, you are a champion. If they make a bar of 60% passing to 90% pass, then you will pass. Because you now have complete clarity. They don't ask you out of this three questions. Either they ask diagnosis, either they ask investigation, either they ask management or treatment. Right? So, 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 you, what do you think? What could be the wrong with this patient? Maybe, sir, I'm due to hemothorax. Uh, saturation is also down. Hemothorax. Yeah. So how, how, how do you get to know that this patient has a hemothorax? Is there a chest injury in this exam? I mean, in this uh, scenario, because they are not mentioning anything on the chest. Oxygen saturation is down, PP also down. Oxygen saturation can be down, can be because of airway compromise, no? because he has a C, motor vehicle accident. On presentation, multiple mandibular, right? So mandible is broken, maxilla is broken, so probably have cervical injury as well, you don't know, right? So mandible and maxilla open, he has nothing to do with the chest now, as of now. And second problem is he has a something wrong in tibia and fibula fracture. So tibia fibula fracture, mandibular and facial or maxillary so facio maxillary injury but lower limb injury or lower limb fracture rather patient is in shock obviously what are the shock uh, definition shock definition is what whenever any patient whenever any patient gets the three four things say for example shock what how you define shock pulse rate is high usually blood pressure is low this is the most important definition of shock shock will not have hypertension any shock there are five type of shock hypovolemic shock right septic shock neurogenic shock anaphylactic shock right and cardiogenic shock so these are the five common causes of shock so in all five causes there are low blood pressure so this patient has a low blood pressure patient has an injury patient has a tachycardia patient has a low oxygen saturation so something compromised with the airway why the oxygen saturation should get low in a patient of facio maxillary injury? Probably something wrong in the airways. That is why the accident, simple mandibular fracture will not, if until and unless larynx, trachea and lungs are not involved and injured, your oxygen will not fall, right? Even, even I am seeing lots of patients in the emergency room. They have multiple fracture on lower limb, pelvis, very bad injury, road traffic. Right, but until and unless airway, chest, ribs are not involved, their SPO2 is 98, 99 in though they are in the shock, but the SPO2 is not known. I mean, not low, right? So now, now, now you tell me what you want to do now. Now, if this patient comes to you in your emergency room, how you do, how you manage? What's the most important thing you feel that that should be done for this patient? Yes, doctor. Air, Bishay, airway, airway comes first. Airway comes first. So, so they something. have already started the uh, oxygen two liters, so it has not improved the saturation because okay. there is a mul multiple uh, facial wounds in this thing, maybe unable to proceed with the uh, nasopharyngeal intubation. So, go for picotherapy. Great. Excellent. Let's see. 
what other experts are saying. Yes, Dr. Rahul, what, what do you think? What do you want to do what, with this patient? Uh, sir, as uh, BP is very low, so initially we need to uh, give the, some fluid so that uh, uh, he would not go in a serious shock. So do you think that giving the fluid will improve the airway or improve the oxygenation? Simultaneously, we will work for the oxygenation. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, this all are important and it's not like that. But considering this vignity of this questions or this clinical scenario, what would you do the best or what is the most important life saving in this patient? This patient will die. You see the parameter, right? Bad fracture, airway compromise, SpO2 low, BP is just 60. We are even worried about 80, 19. This is 60 by 20. It's almost like about to drown. It succumbs, right? collapse if you don't do something urgently for this patient. What do you think? Is it a good parameter? Is it a stable parameter or unstable? Sir, it's definitely it's an unstable parameter. Obviously, it's unstable. Anything, I mean, 60 is uh, anything less than 90 is unstable. Let me tell you. This is how we are cut off line in clinical practice. So, anything systolic less than 90 is uh, critical irrespective of the cause. Anything less than 60 right so so this is what the thing is so so let 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 other any anyone wants to comment on this it's a very important question road traffic accident you every day day to day practice you see this emergency okay. questions yeah. hello yes, doctor yeah yeah go ahead sir yes sir go ahead. <laughs> Sir, as so, the mandible and the maxilla are fractured, so we can't intubate this patient. Great, wonderful. Why? Because it's already been fractured and so we are already been fractured. there is the, there will be a very high risk of injuring more, right? To the airways than yes, improving the patient. Yeah. So you cannot enter from the oral cavity, isn't it? Yes, because sir. Already hmm. been, right? And this is externally you see, right? They are not given any yeah. x-ray, CT scan, blah, blah. So they think that, oh, there is a bad hmm. fracture on mandible maxilla. It's obviously visible mm -hmm. from outside, right? In the road traffic accident. Yes. And mm -hmm. SPO2 is false. So anywhere, anytime when there is SPO2 is low, take home message, you need to do something fast with the airway. If airway is gone, everything is gone. <laughs> right? So now what yes. you do? Right? So, so what you do? You're securing the airway. Yeah. So how you secure? Nasopharyngeal secure? Orofharyngeal, uh, you secure. I will secure with the, uh, means it will be difficult, so we will proceed with cricothyroidity. Yeah, yeah. You had uh, taken your, uh, I mean, I listen your answer, I'm just trying to understand with other colleagues as well. What the thought process? Well, if I not discuss this, then your mind will not work well, right? I want your mind and neurons to work 100% in the exam, right? Until and unless so, you do analysis of any tracheostomy. So, from where you do the tracheostomy? You entered from oral so cavity the, or nasal cavity, so the, from where you entered? So, oral cavity. Oral cavity. But how you enter in the oral cavity when the mandibular fracture is bad, maxillary fracture is bad, probably fracture of base skull, you don't know, never know. Because this patient has a bad injury in general, right? Because he presented with very bad shock, likely hypovolumic shock. But now the also because of upper airway is also compromised, likely because of this uh, injury right so see when there is a write down one dictum or this is basic when you have bad oro pharyngeal uh, facio maxillary injury anytime facio maxillary injury patient is not stable like this patient right first and foremost thing is to do the emergency cricothyroidotomy write down any facio maxillary injury with unstable patient. This patient is at all not stable, right? He is going to die if you don't do anything or secure the airway, patient will gone, is drowning, right? So, first and so administer IV fluid. Uh, after administering the IV fluid, probably the little blood, blood pressure may go up. It is not as critical as, right, uh, the securing the airway, number one. ABC is a routinely part of any emergency, airway, breathing, circulation, we need to monitor. But you need to give the preference out of ABC what is something bad. 
what is the most bad part among abc airway is bad breathing is bad circulation is bad so out of circulation and the airway airway is the more important no? if the patient goes down i mean airway block completely whether bp will go up or not he probably end up with some permanent brain injury because of hypoxia to the brain right so you need to do something for the airway same time you give the administered iv fluid hema seal plasma expander blood blah blah that goes together in emergency room but first most specific thing for this patient if they had not given that okay fine this is a mandibular fracture is not there maxillary fracture is not there just hypotension probably the answer may change to the iv fluid right airway is fine oxygen is fine saturation is fine what's the problem circulatory problem right circulatory problem how you know low blood pressure high pulse rate tachycardia both are there then you may address the circulatory part or iv fluid or take a two side of intracat vigos and you start fast bolus fluid blah blah right so answer may change so you need to uh, watch on it right so what's the answer is cricothyrotomy let me give you the anatomy just not to mugging up the question right so this is the clear cut anatomy of how the things works right so this is the hyoid bone right that you know hyoid most prominent bone which can be felt from your neck in front there are two cartilage one upper cartilage this is a thyroid cartilage let me draw this is a thyroid cartilage shape of thyroid so this is uh, number one is thyroid cartilage right in between another this is another cartilage below the thy thyroid cartilage this is called cricoid cartilage and between thyroid and cricoid cartilage there is a crico and thyroid because it's a common na? thyro and crico so this is crico thyroid ligament this is crico thyroid ligament right and this is the site where you need to emergency make a puncture and secure the airway right so cricothyrotomy will save the patient and if you go below the uh, cricothyrotomy or below the cricoid cartilage uh, this is the trachea so in tracheostomy you are putting the tube here you are putting the tube here in tracheostomy and here you make an incision emergency you just directly take a needle of i mean scalpel of 14 15 16 just puncture that's it airway will open right the dead space is gone airway obstruction is gone then you can put whatever you want to put a tube inside but this is emergency to secure airway so this is the most important in emergency even more faster easier cheaper and uh, no expertise are required because in tracheostomy again expertise are required Cricothyrotomy, you go in your emergency room, anybody can do it. Just see a couple of videos on YouTube, you can learn how to do it. Right? And this is the most important differentiating point between cricothyrotomy and tracheostomy. You must know this. This is absolutely life saving, irrespective of exam. It will help you in your clinical practice as well, especially you are in a uh, hospital setup. So, cricothyrotomy is an emergency, used in emergency. Tracheostomy is usually usually not in emergency, right? It's a plan many a times. Slight more time consuming as well, right? So you, if you want to do it something in one minute, it is a cricothyrotomy. It's a temporary airway access, right? Because you need to just secure the right away. Once you secure airway, everything is well. Patient shifted ICU, and now you want to make a long term airway access. Switch to the tracheostomy. Fiber optic view not required. You don't need to need any scope or any fiber optic. Just puncture in front of the cricothyroid or below thyroid and cricoid cartilage. Here the fiber optic required, right? You need some uh, some blade, right, to enter into the trachea. You need to see the larynx. You need to see the trachea. And you need to insert one tube with a guide wire, right, into the properly in the trachea. So you need a fiber optic in tracheostomy. It can be done in local anesthesia. Here probably many a times anesthesia may require and it should be adequate, right? Done only in adults, right, crico. Why adult? I'll give you the uh, I mean reason as well. Uh, this can be done in adult as well as in children. Less bleeding and complication. Here the less bleeding and complication needs more expertise. You need somebody who knows to intubate. Otherwise, if you intubate in right trachea or right bronchus, then it may end up with some collapse of the opposite lung and a lot of complications. Right? And uh, it is a speedy and it's simple. Right? And this is usually meant for ICU patient. So patients, those who are admitted in ICU, right, you go and see. So they don't have the cricothyrotomy. They have uh, the tracheostomy. It can be done from the oral cavity. If it is everything is fine, like uh, this, place a tube 
in the oral cavity is something wrong, you may attempt from the nasal as well. So both will eventually go to the trachea. That's it. Why it is not recommended in children? So cricothyrotomy is indicated in patient who, can, who cannot be intubated or who have a sustained significant maxillofacial trauma or facio maxillary injury or trauma. Such in this patient who has multiple maxillary and mandibular injury. Cricothyrotomy is also contraindicated in patient of less than 12 years of age. Why? Because risk of damage to the thyroid uh, cricoid cartilage, cartilage and subsequently risk of subglottic stenosis. Just to avoid this, it is not usually preferred below 12 years of age and our patient is a 17 years of age. So that's not a problem. Right. So if they, you, they give you the example. Right. So this is what the logic is. Is that clear, doctor? Ajdani, is it clear to you now, I guess? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. So don't do mistake in exam, brother. Okay? Yes, sir. I will try my best. Wonderful. You are a brilliant man. Question number four. Full term six days old boy present to a physician office routine care. He is tolerating breast milk well. He is urinating, defecating and sleeping normally. Physical exam, pediatric question. Physical examination reveal as an alert newborn with a mild eczema, good skin turgor, normal reflex, musty order. His newborn, labo his, uh, newborn laboratory skin is notably for phenyl ketones in the urine. What is the best advice to give his parents regarding the boy's diet? Increase diet. Increase niacin, increase phenylalanine, uh, uh, increase tyrosine, increase vitamin D. What what do you do? What the advice you give to the patient? <laughs> yes, dog Bahar Toprak. Yes, Doctor Toprak, are you there? <laughs> We have pediatrician yeah, in group as well. Dr. Nirja is pediatrician, consultant pediatrician. Mm -hmm. So she will guide us more. I'm here and, um... So what's the diagnosis? First of all, what's the diagnosis? Our basic questions in this scenario. Uh, what's the diagnosis? Ring. Sorry? Phenylketone rate diagnosis. And Phenylketone um, urea, PKU. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how you diagnose phenyl ketone urea basically? If you are suspecting clinically any patient has a phenyl ketone urea, what test you will send for phenyl ketone urea? How you confirm that? Okay, fine. This is confirmed phenyl ketone urea. Say for example, acute myocardial infarction. You are suspecting you do ECG enzymes. Both are positive. You say, oh, this is acute MI. Not elevation. the phenyl ketone in the urine is enough for diagnosis. Okay. And what advice you give to the parents regarding boys' diet? So this boy is a six-day old, only six-day, full-term six-day old boy, right? Suspecting phenylketone urea because they're notably uh, there in the urine phenylketones. So you confirm the diagnosis. Now you want to tell the dietary advice to the parents. Baby doesn't understand. Six days old baby. So what you tell the parent that you give this, you give not this. Why you selected phenylalanine? Why you selected this phenylalanine? Dr. Nirja, I think we need your expert opinion or your... <laughs> yeah, I, I'll explain definitely. Any comment from you, doctor? I usually we prescribe uh, high protein diet and ask to avoid the phenylalanine rich diet. So I think the answer will be uh, D. Yeah, and that is the answer, what? right? So how common, doctor? I mean, I'm a hemat oncologist, so I very I have seen very few patients of phenyl ketone because of my specialty is different and this. So how frequent or how common this phenyl ketone urea in our Indian population also? I mean, just curiosity. I'm not just trying to, I'm, I'm trying to learn. So how frequent, how many patients a year you can see in your OPD doctor? 
not many actually it's not quite common i haven't seen many cases so uh, okay. i think in one in 20000 something like okay okay so this the incidence prevalence is less right overall fine fair enough great wonderful so so bar this is not a increased phenylalanine rather you need not to give this why this is the pathology in the phenyl ketone urea this child has a phenyl ketone urea pku in pku phenyl alanine cannot convert to tyrosine so there is a tyrosine does not made because there is a problem here they stuck up conversion from phenylalanine cannot convert to tyrosine it is screened for for uh, it screened means this pku can be screened at birth and this is detected by phenyl ketones in the urine these are the uh, two things classical feature of pku is a fair skin eczema musty order uh, this uh, body order mental retardation and mental retardation can be prevented by reducing phenyl alanine and increase the tyrosine in the diet so dr uh, toprak reduce phenyl alanine not increase right here you had given the increase here reduce already phenyl alanine is high yeah, it is not converting into the tyrosine right so you need to give tyrosine right so so that's the answer right so don't get confused in the exam so answer is d that's the correct answer and this is law little story about phenyl ketone urea so i want you to read go properly long scenario never ever confuse with the long scenario so so far we solved four questions four out of 400% excellent score four out of 375% score not bad four out of i mean two out of four is not good answer you are stuck up at 50 and one out of four is very, very not good shape. 56 years old woman is brought to the emergency department by her spouse for evaluation of obtunation. First of all, let me tell what is obtunation. It is given in last three lines. Is a, obtunation is a state similar to the lethargy in which the patient has less interest in environment, shows resp a slowed response to stimulation, and trying to sleep more than normal with drowsiness in between sleep states. So this is general definition of obtundation. So you need to understand what is. So I explained you what is. So you get better understanding of this MCQ. Once again, 56 years old woman is brought to the emergency department by her spouse for evaluation of obtundation. Earlier in the evening, the spouse says the patient complains of shakiness and racing heartbeat. Patient has a type 2 diabetes recently started on sulfonylurea. Patient has begun taking 81 milligram of aspirin at the time of her diabetic diabetes diagnosis. There is a family history of heart disease on examination. Patient is oriented to person only, appears lethargic, diaphoretic. Her temperature is 36.9 or 98.4. Blood pressure is 155 over 91. Pulse rate is 112. Respiratory rate is 18. Laboratory studies are pending. They send some labs, but labs are pending. What do you think? Which of the following is most likely to be used in the management of this patient? So, patient has some symptoms. So, again, you need to make a diagnosis. Then you can answer better. So, they are asking by giving what or by doing which, you uh, how you manage the patient. right? So, there are the four options. So, this is just the question. Are you going to administer epinephrine to this patient? Are you going to administer insulin? You're going to give naloxone, you're going to normalize the glucose or you're going to give plasma, plasminogen activation or pl tissue plasma, TPA basically, tissue plasminogen activator. Right. So these are the few options in the thing. So first you need to understand what the things are going on. What is wrong with this patient? Yes, Dr. Shreya, what, what's your comment? Dr. Shreya, if you can be yes, able sir. to speak. Um, sir, uh, it seems like uh, there is some toxicity of sulfonylurea in the wonderful, patient. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. That's it. This is what the... So, see, patient, right, came with a shakiness, signs of hypoglycemia, tachycardia, signs of hypoglycemia, recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes and started recently sulfonylurea, Sulfonylurea is more hypogenic, hypoglycemic agent than uh, metformin, right? 
बिगवेनाइड सो सो सल्फोनिल यूरिया डायरेक्टली एक्स ऑन इंसुलिन दिस इज अगेन एक्साम क्वेश्चन वेर द सल्फोनिल यूरिया एक्स वेर द मेट फॉर्मिन एक्स सो सल्फोनिल यूरिया एक्स डायरेक्टली ऑन द बीटा सेल्स ऑफ पेनक्रिया रिलीज द इंसुलिन एंड डू द डाउन द ब्लड शुगर वाइल मेट फॉर्मिन डज नॉट एक्ट ऑन द इंसुलिन इट एक्स ऑन द लिवर सेल इट ट्राई टू पेरीफरिली यूटिलाइज मोर ग्लूकोज राइट and uh, that is why the hypoglycemia is less common in metformin than in uh, sulfonylurea because sulfonyl directly stimulate the insulin so this is a classical uh, this signs of hypoglycemia so you just correct it hypoglycemia and your problem is solved right so so this is a uh, symptoms of all hypoglycemia classical right epinephrine is why not epinephrine because we are not suspecting this as a anaphylactic shock insulin administration will worsen the process because already hypoglycemia and you are giving insulin means you are killing the patient naloxone is a antidote of what yes tell me naloxone anyone and naloxone is used for which poisoning opioid opioid person opioid person opioid you yeah so that is what you ne also need to know all the things you need to know abcd your job is not just to give the answer d is correct answer that is good that your answer is good correct i am happy but the same time cultivate this practice that why this why this is not a pain a pain why not insulin why not this why not this right so i i am telling you why not this because we are not suspecting anaphylactic shock so no no need to give epinephrine insulin will worsen the process rather than benefit because already in hypoglycemia you giving insulin more hypoglycemia no rather it is contraindicated naloxone we are not uh, suspecting the poisoning and T tpa we are not suspecting this is not a stroke patient right so correct appropriate answer is a glucose that's it switch to next question 5 out of 5 is excellent score 55 year old man with a diabetes hypertension history of pneumonia treated as an outpatient 20 years earlier present to the clinic again during early fall for a blood pressure check he currently works as a respiratory therapist at local hospital the physician suggests that he receive a pneumococcal vaccine what is the primary indication for receiving the vaccine right so there are five six things in the same scenario right you need to understand what is the most important right so age they are saying age right so age is 55 what is out of which is the most important patient has a diabetes so because of diabetes you want to give patient has a hypertension so because of hypertension you want to give the pneumococcal patient has a pneumonia right so patient has a pneumonia right so that is why uh, you want to give this uh, vaccine or patient is a healthcare worker why because he is a working in a phys he is a respiratory therapy so he is always dealing with the patient with the respiratory things so now what's the question right so he goes to the doctors right for blood pressure check he basically went for blood pressure check and doctor suggested you must go and take the pneumococcal vaccine so because of age we are giving because of diabetes we are giving because he is a health worker he is more prone to develop pneumonia we are giving is hypertension is a risk factor for pneumonia so you want to give a pneumococcal vaccine or he already has a pneumonia so you want to give a pneumococcal vaccine think over it what do you think that i am giving you excellent clue right but exam you need to figure it out by your own i am not there to dissect the questions diabetes dr chinchu what do you think Amongst what most important thing? This questions looks easy but tricky. Any comment, Doctor Chinchu? Doctor Selma, any comment, Doctor Selma? Yes, Doctor Selma. Any comment? 
so no comment anyone any volunteer uh, this, uh, diabetes is uh, immunocompromised state so i think i'll prove that uh, sir i think it's okay because every 50 plus should get a ibuprofen vaccine with respect to their occupation or morbidity So what what age is more risk factor? Diabetes is already patient as a diabetes is more risk factor. Healthcare yeah. worker is a more risk factor. So what is the they they asked what is the primary indication for receiving the vaccine? Primary indication in this patient. Yeah, I mean everything is important. Age is important. Diabetes is important. Healthcare worker is more prone to develop infection. So we all are taking pneumococcal as a doctor. We are also taking hepatitis B, maybe blood to blood contact, right? So, so, so let's the literature check your answer. The answer is diabetes. Diabetes is an indication for vaccine given that diabetic patients are considered to be immunocompromised. Diabetics, especially poorly controlled diabetic patients, are vulnerable to infection. the chronic hyperglycemia of diabetes lead to abnormalities in the cell mediated immunity there are two cell mediated and humoral antibody means the x through the antigen antibody so this is one is a humoral one is cell mediated so this cell mediated or t lymphocytes gets involved here so cell mediated immunity and phagocytosis function also the vascular impairment of diabetic prevents the immune system from responding appropriate to an infectious challenge so amongst all the list diabetes is the most important let's go a age more than 65 years old age is an indication for pneumococcal vaccine sir javlikar sir it is 55 years of age in our uh, our this this is guideline huh? this is not from my side yes. it's not my this guideline yes. so this is this patient is 50, 55 years guideline says 65 years so again 55 is not age indication if anybody is more than 65 right you give the prophylactic pneumococcal vaccine fine not at 55 age 65 old is an indication for pneumococcal vaccine as the elderly and very young are especially susceptible for the infection with pneumococcal answer c is incorrect healthcare workers are recommended to receive pneumococcal vaccine due to their exposure in the work setting however for this patient is immunocompromised state secondary to diabetes is more pressing reason to administer the vaccine not just the healthcare worker so healthcare workers versus diabetes diabetes is more dangerous because the immunocompromised state hypertension is not at all important and e current respiratory infection so any infections right current infection vaccine is contraindicated if you have your typhoid today and you are giving typhoid vaccine tomorrow it's contraindicated if you have hepatitis b now ongoing and you are giving hbsg vaccine contraindicated sorry so any ongoing infections of the same disease it's contraindicated next question 6 out of 6 excellent score 6 out of 3 is not good score seven questions you are called by a laboratory which reports gram positive cocci in cluster growing from the blood culture bottle what is the best next step in the management today i try to compile questions from all different department not from only surgery medicine gynec all heterogeneous various different different so overall your knowledge get check you are called by the laboratory which reports gram positive cocci in clusters growing from the blood culture bottle what is the best next step in the management you start oxacillin you start erythromycin you start vancomycin you start doxycycline you consult i id or infectious disease specialist you call him wait for specialization and sensitivity report so you need exactly sensitivity report and then you decide that okay what to do and this probably it's a contamination don't worry nothing to do no treatment that's all forget about everything how you manage this all practical questions if you are working in icu this is everyday routine question One plus somebody is joined as a one plus. I don't know the name. Can you discuss one plus CPH two five six nine? Yes, one plus anyone one plus. We are more than thirty forty doctors in the group, but I got only two three answers. 
I want everyone to give answer. Don't worry about right or wrong, but post the answer. Consider that this question will come in your exam. How you react? And this all will come, believe me. Post answer fast. Yes, Dr. Zainab Ali Hassan. Any comment? Okay, you just text the message. Staphylococcus. Okay, fine. Staphylococcus. Dr. Muzni, any comment on this? Anyone? Anyone wants to make any comment on this? That uh, This shows that Staphylococcus is grown. So, Initially, when the results, sensitivity results are not there, we should cover the MRSA. So, we should give a vagomyce. Okay. Why not oxacillin? That oxacillin also covers. Is a spectrum which doesn't cover uh, MRSA. Great. So, it doesn't, oxacillin doesn't cover the MRSA. Erythromycin? Erythromycin not covering MRSA. Okay. Doxycycline? No. Okay. So, only vancomycin from the list given is covered by MRSA. Yeah. Right. And what do you th makes you to think of MRSA? No, I mean, it is a little common uh, in the uh, hospitals. Uh, MRSA cases are common. So, we will wait for the uh, sensitive result. Then we can step down. We don't start with the narrow spectrum. You don't start with what? Narrow spectrum. You should cover. Okay. Yeah, broad spectrum. So you want to give something which is like uh, proven or which covers the things, right? Once yeah. the sensitivity comes, then it's fine. Right. So your answer is absolutely correct. And uh, the explanation is also 100% correct. So this is what the, let me take you to little microbiology class. So just understanding, it's a very interesting picture. Gram positive, gram negative. So this all gram positive is stained by the different stains. So it is in same color. This is in the same color. So gram positive, uh, this is called GPB and this is called GNB, gram negative bacilli or bacteria. So sapphile, this is in the cluster. They are what they are saying, uh, right? Gram positive cocaine cluster. So gram positive cocaine cluster, it looks like a staphylococcus and it's a methicillin resistant. There are two type of uh, they they classified uh, in microbiology as a uh, in a two part right methicillin sensitive and methicillin resistant so methicillin sensitive is good but methicillin resistance are in hospital setup very common and uh, uh, all the antibiotics what it is given here doesn't cover uh, the uh, things right so answer is a right so so MRSA methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus and it is not covered by oxycycline, I mean oxacycline, not covered by uh, this, uh, sorry, yeah, not covered by erythromycin, not as sensitive, not covered by uh, the antibiotic list given here. So the most appropriate answer is the vancomycin in any patient. Just this is the basic rule. I mean, you don't need to mug up. Any patient when there is a blood culture positive, na, don't ask anybody. Don't ask any infectious specialist help. Don't ask for repeat sample. First, start the antibiotic. It is the most easiest, most simplest way of saving the patient, right? Because culture sensitivity never ever come before 48 hours or 72 hours, right? Never ever comes, right? So because it needs some time to bacteria to grow in the culture media, right? So it takes 48, sometimes 72 hours. Because I am keep chasing every day to the lab, right? But they have standard answers. So don't call me before 40 hours. Nothing will grow. You understand? So what I supposed to do being a clinician, I cannot wait in the patient who has a blood culture positive. Means absolutely it is a, a case of, right, septicemia. It's a case of septicemia. So you can't afford to wait. Patient may will go in shock, no? septicemic shock. It is one of the shock, Right. So, this patient, so when there is a blood culture positive, right? So, methicillin sensitive staphylococcus aureus 
and methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus they are usually in the cluster right so they are usually in the uh, cluster right and so you do the blood culture and blood culture is positive in hospital settings so always think of mrsa methicillin resistant the drug is vancomycin right first treatment so 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 what happens you you send the blood culture they shows uh, they shows just uh, gram positive cocaine cluster they they told you right at the end of 6 hours right but if you ask sir what is the sensitivity which drug i supposed to use then microbiology saying that sensitive <laughs> your drug sensitivity is in the process it may take 48 hours so now you know this is blood culture you grown it takes 48 hours now what to do for 48 hours are you going to uh, do nothing for this patient who has a very bad blood culture positive means it is absolutely proven case of septicemia right so in that case you need to give the drug which is sensitive for mrsa one is vancomycin what other drugs list doctor safi that apart from vancomycin, other drugs you also can use for MRSA. It is given in Master of the Board and many literature. There are a lot of drugs we are using clinically. If the patient is very sensitive or hypersensitivity to vancomycin, which is administered and he have bad reaction to vancomycin, now you cannot give the vancomycin to the patient. What's the next option? Anyone open? Anybody? It is uh, fifth generation plus four inch one. Can you name the drug? I just forgot. Fifth generation, there are a lot of drugs. So, yes, so somebody told me linezolid. So linezolid is linezolid also covers MRSA. Yeah, line, so, yeah, so that is what I need to know. Na? I want to know. Linezolid, I think you must have. Na? It's not a very uncommon drug. We are using many linezolid, right? And we are using a lot in the cellulitis. Linezolid, meropenem, imipenem. Yes or no? Yeah. Right. So your homework is also that you need to know which drugs, right, which covers the MRSA. Extremely most important question. If they wants to ask any questions from Staphylococcus, they ask MRSA. It's a very common clinical practice, especially in ICU. And more if those patients who have a catheters in the neck, right? We, that is what we call as a central line. Have you heard of central line, right? So central line, when they have, right, from the skin, the staphylococcus main gets entered into the blood culture, right? So these all lines, they are at highest risk of development. So based empiric treatment, empiric means what? Sensitivity is not there. So you are suspecting that this is MRSA and you don't know the drug. So empiric treatment of gram-positive cocci growing from blood culture is vancomycin. Right, if if there is an intolerance or allergic to vancomycin, you can see linezolid, daptomycin, or septarolin. That is what the fifth generation cephalosporin. So linezolid, daptomycin, and septarolin. These are the drug can be used for this. Clear cut sentence: oxacillin is not first because it not covers the MRSA. Right, erythromycin and macrolid means azithromycin are not adequately cover the Staphylococcus <laughs> bacteria. Again, it is a not good choice, right? So the good choice among the list is that that you need to use the vancomycin because oxacillin and uh, erythro is not good coverage. Ox is obviously not good coverage. Based amongst MRSA is vancomycin. Never ask any infectious specialist before you start the treatment. So you start the treatment, you give the antibiotic vanco, then you call anybody, whatever you want to call, right? And whatever the test you want to do, and never assume it is a contamination because it's blood culture positive. Even though it is a contamination, you give vancomycin and then do research, whatever you want to do. But if this is a genuine and you think it is a contamination, patient will die in 48 hours because of bad septicemia. So don't make a risk or life risk to the patient. Whenever blood culture positive, you give. That's it. This is the dictum. All clear? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes, yes. You are not sleeping in the afternoon, 12 o'clock in India now. Probably 10, 13 Dubai and Middle East. So hopefully everybody is awake. That is why I keep asking repeatedly. 
tell me yes or no. Yes, ticoplanin is also can be used. Yes, Dr. Rahul, you are right. So, ticoplanin is also a drug of choice for uh, this uh, MRSA. You are right. Fine. Last couple of questions. Just concentrate with me. A 43-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department after being burned in a house fire. You estimate first degree burns 20% of the body, second degree burns 11% of the body, third degree burns is 9% of the body. Her weight is 60 kg and height is 160 centimeter tall. What IV therapy would you begin immediately to the patient who is has a history of burns? So basically burns case, you want to start fluid, how you calculate, how you give. So ringer lactate 200 ml per hour for 24 hours, normal saline 400 ml per hour for 24 hours. Another is normal saline 150 for 8 and 75 for 16, 300 for 8 hours and then 150 hour per hour for next 16 and last ringer lactate 600 per hour for 8 and then 300 for next 16. Next 16. Just calculate. Who's the answer? There are a lot of doctors in the house. Who's the answer? Just two, three answer I got it so far. Calculate it. There is one calculator. I cannot give you the clue, but still I'll give you. There is a formula called as a Parkland formula. Parkland. So you need to apply the Parkland formula for the calculation of the burns fluid management in first 24 hours. So you need to know the Parkland formula. You apply that Parkland formula here. Then your job is easy. Dr. Kaushika, do you have any comment on your this? You there in the class, Dr. Kaushika? Yes, sir. So how you calculate, doctor, if the so question comes? Uh, into uh, 20, uh, into 16, uh, uh, into body you, pain. You, you calculate in your things, no? If you have something, you can yes, calculate sir. and tell me. Yes, sir. Yes. Pen and paper. I'll I'll wait for thirty seconds. No, I'm not in a. Okay. I want you to okay. learn and understand. Okay, so any answer came? D, sir. 300 cc per hour for 8 hours. And then 150 cc per hour for next. Wonderful. So that's answer. So first understand what is Parkland formula for burns. So this is the Parkland formula. Those who don't know the Parkland formula, understand the Parkland formula. Parkland formula, B, catch here is a first degree burns is not count in the fluid calculation. Not count, first degree. Second degree burns count, third degree burns count. So let's go to the scenario, right? So we understand. So what they are saying, 43-year-old woman, emergency department for being burned in a house fire, right? First degree, 20% burns. So we are not counting 20% burns. Second is 11 and third is 9% and weight is 60. So second and third degree burns count. So second is 11 and third is 9. So 11 plus 9, right? So 11 plus 9. So second degree burns is a 11 percent and third is a nine percent right so we just calculate 11 and nine so this is 11 percent plus nine percent so total percentage of burn is at 20 percent okay so this is one thing right so what is the formula volume of ringer lactate is 4 ml fix 
मल्टी बाय बाय परसेंटेज ऑफ बंस तो परसेंटेज इस हाउ मच ट्वेंटी परसेंट सो हियर वी पुट ट्वेंटी परसेंट एंड वेट ऑफ द बॉडी इज अ सिक्सटी केजी राइट एंड फोर सो फोर मल्टीप्लाई बाय ट्वेंटी मल्टीप्लाई बाय सिक्सटी इट्स इक्वल टू टोटल फोर्टी हेड हंड्रेड जस्ट फॉर योर नॉलेज नाउ व्हाट दे आर सेइंग हाफ हाफ ऑफ द फोर्टी एट हंड्रेड इज अ ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड हाफ इन नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी हाफ इयर सो दिस इज इन द फर्स्ट एट आवर्स सो ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड डिवाइडेड बाय एट इज इक्वल टू थ्री हंड्रेड सो थ्री हंड्रेड पर आर फॉर एट आवर्स एंड हियर सिक्सटीन डिवाइडेड बाय ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड इज अ वन फिफ्टी एम एल पर आवर सो वन फिफ्टी एम एल पर आवर फॉर नेक्स्ट सिक्सटीन आवर्स सो इन हियर ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड इन सिक्सटीन आवर्स हियर ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड इन एट आवर्स टोटल फोर्टी एट हंड्रेड इन अ ट्वेल्व आवर्स ट्वेंटी फोर आवर्स सॉरी That's it. So this is formula, right? So here, if you find do a fine adjustment, look for the answer where there is the answer is three hundred per hour for eight hours, and then one fifty for sixteen. So it is there in the answer. So three hundred per hour for eight hours, and then one fifty for next sixteen. So this is the answer. It is not a mugging up the things. You need to understand the logic, and you need to know the Parkland formula. If you know the Parkland formula, you can answer any question. I have just taken one example. So this formula is extremely important for first twenty-four hours fluid management in patients of burn where first degree count is, degree burns is not count. Just to confuse you, I had given first degree burns as well because if you calculate first degree burns as well, then it would be the different answer. Then answer would be six hundred. Because volume will increase, now forty multiply by four multiply by sixty, right? So that's all. So remember the Parkland formula. Nothing much. Uh, picture questions, very easy one-liner questions. That's it. You will like this type of questions, but unfortunately, not asking exam. They ask long, long scenario, but just one-liner. Identify the grade of diabetic retinopathy. This is the picture. They are do some giving some kind of nipping, AV nipping, atrioventric, I mean, atriovenous nipping here on the fundoscopy or this retinal examination. So, is it grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four? You need to figure it out. They may ask you such kind of questions, so don't get surprised. Post all. Everybody post the answer. We are too much of doctors today in the class. Many doctors in the class. Around thirty still. Mm, many doctors. Doctor Shreya, what do you think? Doctor Saba Imtiaz, what do you think? What could be the grade of the? Retinopathy is this the very favorite question in exam. No answer. Fine, fair enough. There are four grades. This grade one. This is a grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. So grade one is atrioventric. Uh, sorry, arteriolar thickening and tortuosity. Just the tortuosity. Second is this grade one plus constriction of the vein. At atrial crossing, so artery and veins are crossing. That is called uh, AV nipping, right? Arterial venous nipping, right? So this is the grade two here. The artery and veins are crossing. That is the word called as a nipping. Third is a retinal ischemia. Is a third a retinal ischemia reduction of the blood supply, probably diabetes. You see the cotton wool appearance here, and papillary edema, right? So this is grade four. So you just need to remember this because sometimes they ask these questions. I have seen a couple of times they are asking the grades of retinopathy, and let's see. Last but not the least, uh, nine of nine out of nine is excellent score. Sorry. Where is my slides?
वन सेकंड मंथ With her second pregnancy, she experienced a preterm delivery at 34 week gestation of a male neonate who died within the first day of life. At that delivery, the baby was swollen with skin lesion and the placenta was very large. She was treated with the antibiotic, but she cannot remember what they were. On a routine prenatal uh, panel with this current pregnancy, she is found to have a positive VDRL test. what is the next step in the management you do fta abs you do intramuscular penicillin you look for the lupus anticoagulant you look for go for oral penicillin or you do for the rpr test yeah you go ahead Yes, you want what you want to do from this list. Anyone volunteer? Any volunteer? The new one, not the old one. Yes, Doctor Zaina Bali Hassan. Any any comment? Yes. Any comment? No comment. Yes, Doctor Shreya. What What's your thought process for this question? So, sir, in this case, uh, we will confirm uh, with a. So, what's the likely diagnosis for this patient? Sir. It's query syphilis. Okay, great. So it's a query or possible syphilis. Okay, fine. And you yeah. find in a prenatal checkup that she has a VDRL. So on yes. the VDRL basis, Then you confirm, want to investigate, confirm, to or you start the treatment. Okay, so you want to confirm. How you confirm? Sir, A. A F T A B S. That's correct. So that's the answer, right? the next yes. step after any positive screening test is the confirmatory test so say for example hiv if you i have one patient is in emergency accident trauma case and they they have done the test right hiv positive on rapid test right so on that test you cannot start the treatment you need to confirm with a western blot right so same way here the any vdrl syphilis positive you need to confirm sometimes it could be a false positive so on that test initial test you cannot confirm right you cannot start so you confirm so fta what do you mean by fta fluorescent treponema pallidum antibody right fluorescent treponemal antibody that is fta abs absorption test right so this test right is right this confirms the diagnosis of syphilis it confirms so initial test vdrl it's a screening test but once the vdrl positive right in pregnant non pregnant you you need to confirm with the a uh, confirmatory test and once the syphilis is confirmed then treatment would be intramuscular penicillin that's it now see the sensitivity uh, on the diagnostic test by stain so vdrl and rpr in primary syphilis it is 85% sensitive secondary and tertiary almost 95 to 99 and fta abs you can see primary secondary and tertiary it is almost more than 95% sensitive and specific so this is the most important test fta abs so whenever vdrl is positive it is uh, i mean uh, you need to confirm with it so that's all for today for my uh, mock test i before ending up my session i would be very glad uh, to have some feedback uh, 
from the audience right how you understand and how you learn especially the new guys i would be happy to have a quick comment especially the new one anyone new old it's fine what's the new learning for you or what's the new things which you i mean feel that this will probably help you a lot in the future to solve the mcq anything dr haifa any comment dr dinesh jawalikar any comment sir uh, yes sir it was a really an eye opener for me because okay uh, great i got an idea how to approach the questions and how to answer the questions and can you speak little li louder your mic is bit i think far away can you make little closer so everybody gets yes, a yes sir message yes sir ha huh. uh, i was saying it was an eye opener for me if truly because I, and i learned the approach how to approach the questions and how okay. theory is important as a solving the mcqs so we okay. need to know a lot and the your your style of explaining the questions was very good sir i was very impressed and it was very thank nice very session much. for me yes, sir. it was very nice session sir for me thank you sir thank you very much i must appreciate your time sir thank you you are welcome we have a lots of mock test on sunday especially i'm getting more time so i you can and engage yourself in the next mock anyway no problem yes, yes. anyone else anyone else sir anyone there is else? a doubt sorry sir there is a doubt sir the second question second yeah question it... means mcq is number second yes sir let me that uh, amyloidosis uh... yes amyloidosis this is amyloidosis yes sir yeah. sir in this question uh, the ecg shows uh, low voltage also so in mi also there can be a possibility of that so shouldn't yeah, we that... actually con confirm the uh, cardiac enzyme first they are not showing except see when mi is very rare if you see 100 acute mi say for example very rarely you get with the low things right second thing is uh the the mi patient they usually have some kind of uh, i mean risk factor like hypertension diabetes family history obesity smoking nothing is given in this scenario right here there is a no classical presentation of acute mi like uh, chest pain right they have more of heart failure breathlessness fatigue abdominal distension which you usually don't see uh, abdominal distension in acute mi which can be seen in cardiac failure right so so in in context with compiling everything and they had a strong history of amyloidosis that is more important so amyloidosis patient will die because of heart failure not because of usually mi right so if you club up all the things together echo is more important if they have classical chest pain high risk factor enzymes i mean something more goes st elevations right so here there's just the low voltage they mention they don't mention st elevation low voltage st elevation that is not mentioned right low mm. voltage just qrs complex low voltage and this is universal not in lead 1 2 3 or some specific lead so in general completely right so there is a very less chance that oh all the 12 leads right avr avl avf v1 v2 v3 v6 v every everywhere chest lead and limb lead everything is low it is something which is restrictive like amyloidosis sarcoidosis as we discuss right sometimes the iron deposition hemochromatosis that you get usually such kind of ecgs so not much in favor of acute mi that is why enzymes are not answered okay. you got it yes sir okay fine thank you very much if uh, anyone wants to give the last comment i would be glad dr kalai any any new learning from you kaushika kalai fine no problem that's it so thank you very much all your for kind attentions and presence enjoy your evening sunday and stay tuned we'll see you in the next lectures of mock test thank you very much once again and have a nice day take care bye bye Thank you all bye